And welcome to Al Dente Rigamortis. I'm Review Cultist. I'm Dr. Leviathan. And I'm Mikey. The E stands for evil. And tonight we have a very special guest. Hi, this is Matt again from the Drunk and Ugly and Ugly Talk and the my Let's Play series. I also stream. I'm a man of many talents and all of them are garbage. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't, don't, uh, don't belittle yourself. You do a lot of stuff online. You have, you have many followers. You, you probably have more followers well, than thanks. we do. thanks. That, mean, that means a lot, cultist. <laughs> really? Really? You're going to try and make him feel good by comparing him to us? <laughs> y- y- yes. <laughs> I thought we liked Matt. <laughs> hey. Uh, <clears throat> and we're here to discuss those internet stories, most creepy and most pasta. And tonight we're doing Pen Pal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> pen Pal. <laughs> what more could be said about Pen Pal? <laughs> uh, a lot. Yeah. Like 230-something pages. Yeah. Uh, for those not in the know, Creepypastas are short internet stories that get copy placed across the internet. However, this is not a short, creepy internet story. This is a very long, creepy internet story. Um, well, but, I think we could say it's like six different short, creepy internet stories. Yeah. Uh, seven, if you have the print version like I do. Yeah, because there was one, there's some extensions added on to the, uh, when it became a novel. Also, is it a novel or a novella? Uh, it says a novel. I don't know. I think a novella is like, is like in the 70, 80 page range. Okay, I'm so not actually I, sure what defines a novella. Unless Stephen but King writes it, in which case it's far longer, <laughs> as is always the case with him. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But no, novel and novella might just be like whatever, you, whatever the hell you want to call them. Okay, yeah. One's um, usually shorter than the other. Yeah, uh, and yeah, this one was done uh, by One Thousand Vulture. You said it was earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, vultures. yeah. The Reddit Reddit user One Thousand Vultures uh, or Dathan Auerbach, as his uh, as is written on the cover uh, of the book. Did we ever? Nobody looked up to see if that was an actual name from like a different country or something. Or I have no idea where he's. <laughs> I have no idea where he's from. Yeah, it, it, I, from the sound from the base of the of the novel he or the stories he he bases sounds it out very of, like, American yeah. like his. And it sounds um, like it was Southern on, uh, American, like in like the Southern states kind of thing. Uh, I got kind of like a general Midwest sort of vibe off of it. Yeah. Yeah. Me Where, too. Yeah, because it didn't really snow, but they'd like go out into like the. Oh, but like, it got lake. cold. Yeah, it got cold enough that they couldn't go swimming in a lake. <laughs> um, yeah, it got it got yeah. to it got to coat weather at some point in this book. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um... But yeah, I guess we should actually dive into the plot of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the uh, I guess the broad overview is that this is uh, the like the broad overview of this whole thing, which it's as we said before, it's like seven different, well, six or seven different stories. Is they're all kind of connected by this theme of the main character who is intentionally unnamed uh, to the point where in one of the stories uh, his name is actually redacted from something. Uh, so for the sake of expediency, uh, I'm just going to call him Steve. Um, <laughs> I was wondering when you when we talked on uh, before the show, I, uh, you said Steve, you referenced Steve, and I was like, did they did they say his name earlier? <laughs> so, no, they okay. don't. There's a part, uh, if you remember, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, yeah. but I think in yeah. the first or second story... Yeah, I remember seeing um, yeah. that. It has name in brackets. Right, yeah. And then they also, like, yeah, and then... And then he also had an underline for the name of his uh, elementary school. Oh, yeah, like a blank spot where it should be, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the book, they actually put in the, uh, they actually put in, like, the redacted marks, so it's just black lines. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, which I'm surprised they didn't do on there because it's just a Unicode character. Mm-hmm. There's a Unicode character for Big Black Box. Um, but anyway, yes. So 
except for like all but like one of these stories, it, it follows Steve, and Steve is being stalked by s- some guy who is obsessed who is obsessed with him for reasons we never know, and likes to take a lot of pictures of him. And so this whole thing, the way the novel frames it, and the reason that the, and the the way the novel kind of comes up to to explain how this guy who's following him seems to be different in every story, and also collects how this is like you know six different stories. It starts with a prologue that says like basically he's kind of retra- trying to figure out like what was going on and talking about the impermanence of memory and stuff. Uh, Let's see, there's, I mean, like, the thing it mentions is, like, he, it it talks about, like, he worked, he used to work at, like, an ice cream store, and there's this girl who, like, broke down in tears because she couldn't figure out what ice cream she wanted, so he gave her, like, a scoop that had the, all the ice creams she wanted on it and said, like, a couple years from now, she's never going to remember that, even though it was, like, the happiest day in her life right now, and... So, yeah, it just talks about, like, my life is crazy and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And some things might have changed because, like, I was a kid and I and this was just a person that I kind that as a child, I probably turned into a monster in my head. And then it has a quote from Harlan Ellison. (laughs) Now we get in the middle and later learn the beginning. The end will take care of itself. Um, Harlan Ellison, if you don't know, is the writer of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. Uh, he's there's a lot of great stories about Harlan uh, about Harlan Ellison the man not even stories written by Harlan Ellison um, but that's a that's something for a different time yeah not uh, creepy um, stories that get posted on the internet <laughs> yeah he's just got creepy stories that will haunt your mind all right so anyway we start with uh, the first story is footsteps. Now I'm gonna i I'm gonna concede I've only ever read the novel version of this. I'm not sure how much editing went into it. Um between the creepypasta version and the published version. Um so let's see. Actually, so, sorry, before you begin, yeah, I should actually add on to that. Uh yeah, I had um Dr. Leviathan, Mikey, the Sense for Evil, and myself, Review Cultist, read the creepypastas compiled on creepypasta.wiki, uh, which are like the the original Reddit posts. Um, and then Matt, you've read the novel, like you said. So, like, I wanted to, like, yeah, see, like, if there were any differences. So, like, when you go, yeah, I should have read, I should have read the Reddit version, but like, yeah. honestly, like, this is long enough that I probably would have forgotten any like subtle differences in there. Like, yeah. this is. I have a feeling that on its face, the writing in this is a lot more competent, so we're not going to see things like Happy Happy, where, like, in one version of the story, it's like, my house got burnt down, so I bought a new house that was fireproof. Yeah. Well, yeah, like, I mean, I'm curious to see, like, what the, if there are any differences, but honestly, like, reading it, I mean, there are some issues, but the stories themselves were relatively consistent. <laughs> like, no, nowhere yeah. near as bad as Happy Happy. Yeah, no, Happy Miles, Happy was a train wreck. Like years away. Yeah. No, this is this is competently written. Weird. It actually has like pacing and twists and things. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, and so, it went through story. an edit that was deeper than spell check. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let's see. So footsteps. Um. Footsteps is kind of the. All right, so we start with Steve talking about how he lives in a trailer home. He didn't and didn't realize like when he was a kid that he was poor, but now he understands that he was poor because he lived in a trailer home. Um, and that I guess his subdivision was like I might be mixing this up with one of the later stories, but his subdivision was originally like a bunch of big houses, and then the property from those was sold off, and uh, smaller homes were put on there, mostly trailer homes that surround these old big houses now. <laughs> Um, but anyway, he talks about how he lived, uh, his, his backyard led directly into the woods and he liked to, he liked to explore out there and imagine that there were monsters. Um, and, uh, he can, and at night when he's sleeping, um, he can hear sounds from within, uh, from within his crawl space, um, and within his house. And he reiterates the fact that it's a trailer home to point out that the, uh, the trailer homes are built on stilts. Yeah. Um, because they're just laid down by vehicles and like they come in two halves and they're sewn together. And so they put them on the stilts so that, uh, so that the assembly can happen and then they make it look like a real house. Um, I mean, I guess it is a real house. It's just, it's a very cheap and mobile house. 
Um, but let's see. Uh, and yeah, it also mentions how there's like a vent that you can pry off and climb in, and there's this whole huge crawl space underneath the house. And we're also introduced to Steve's friend, Josh, um, who uh, I think this happens during the summer of, what is it, the summer between kindergarten and first grade? Yeah. Um, most of these stories happen between or between, yeah, between kindergarten and first grade for him. Um, and yeah, he introduces his best friend, Josh, who they always go out in the woods and they play fort and play in the ditch and stuff and throw dirt at each other because they're kids. Um let's see uh and then so throughout the throughout a few parts of the of footsteps the the titular footsteps keep happening and he keeps hearing somebody walk around in his house and this leads to um one night he uh he wakes up um what is it actually he he wakes up he he wakes up on a different bunk i think one night in his house yeah. he's yeah he's on the top bunk he's sleep, uh, cuz he's got bunk, bunk he's he got bunk beds even though he doesn't have yeah. even though he's the only one cuz yeah also i, I think he yeah. it was also like trying to explain actually that, i had like, <laughs> growing up i had bunk beds even though i was the only person who slept in that room nice um yeah he also tries to explain that like the uh, footsteps um he's been hearing like he's trying to think like i guess rationalize it that it's his heartbeat or something yeah and he puts his ear to his or pillow. it's the house settling or whatever yeah yeah the yeah. ear to the pillow is what he says um that's and i rationalize it that a footstep sounds a lot different than your heart beating into a pillow <laughs> yeah but i mean he's a kid so he exaggerates and that's kind of the the thing of the story yeah. but um, yeah, it's this sort of and it's this it's yeah it's kind of this i think it's also this thing which um there's also a like a short film based on footsteps that make it that makes it make more sense where like he keeps going to his mom and saying like mom i'm hearing someone walk in the house and she's like go go the hell back to bed yeah. i need to work in the morning and it's like i'll, I'll hear um, take this medicine it'll make you go to sleep no it's not gonna work it, take this medicine i'm tired of waking up in the middle of the night because <laughs> you're waking up in the middle of the night <laughs> Yeah, you get yeah. some like, I got some Baba Duke vibes off of that, but um, that's neither that's, here nor there. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so after a couple of nights of the footsteps in the house and the, the scratching under the crawl space and waking up in another bed, one night he wakes up in the middle of the woods, no memory of how he got there, and uh, aside from like, there's no marks or wounds except like he steps on a thorn because there's a bunch of thorn bushes, um. And there's a lot of there's actually a lot of detail in this about like um, about like the exhaustion of like trying to walk out of the woods when you're lost and like how much your feet hurt after like walking through the wilderness with no shoes on and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, let's see. He's trying and, and Steve tries a bunch of different ways to get out of the woods. He knows there's like a pile of Christmas trees he can uh, that are near the edge of the woods that will lead him back to the ditch. And there's also this, like, recurring riddle that comes up in here from his grandfather saying, like, how far can you go into the woods? And then I think he remembers that, like, as he's trying to, like, climb a tree. And he kind of uses it to as his, like, as sort of, it's like his comforting line because the his answer mantra. to it is, yeah, I'll say, yeah, his mantra, that's a good one. Yeah. And, like, he, he keeps using that as his line because the answer to the riddle is like, you can only go halfway into the woods because once you're halfway in, you start going out. And so it's like, I just need to walk in a straight direction and eventually I'll leave. Okay, that's kind of interesting because um, that's not in the, the original Creepypasta. Really? <laughs> or the, it's not, it's yeah, not um, mentioned because I also watched the short film like early before, like a couple of hours ago, and they had that in there. I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, that wasn't in the story. <laughs> okay, so the how the, so the, the woods riddle is a new thing. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah. it was weird because, yeah, one of the things that's, that's, that's weird in the novel is the, is the cutaway to the grandfather telling this riddle kind of comes in like it it feels kind of out of place and then they work it in as like i'll i'll just keep walking straight because once i get far enough into the woods i'll start walking out yeah and then he also like he gets starts lost do, right sorry he he also gets yeah, he lost gets and... really he, he gets really lost like and then um and like as he starts trying to just plot a second course uh he hears us he hears like a branch snap behind him and starts running um and oh yeah, one of the defining marks when he gets to when he wakes up is he finds this pool raft that's like a shark that's long since deflated near him, yep, and yep. also he's like in a, he's in like a tiny ditch or something. Um, 
and he runs through the woods, like, trying to evade his captor, and after a while, he finds, like, the pool shark again, and realizes yeah. he just ran in a big-ass circle. Um, and so then he looks, I think he, he, yeah, he gets out by looking at the Northern Star, and just keeps following that, like, using that as his way to stay walking in a straight line, um... And then he finally he finally sees the Christmas trees and gets back to the ditch, gets back to his house, and then he's, like, grabbed by somebody, and he's, like, fighting them and attacking them. And then somebody else comes up to him, and he realizes that it's the police, and he's kicking his mom a lot, because um, she came up behind him. Um, I also remember there's a really good... There's a, there's also, like, another, like, kind of cutaway that's really... Uh, that's really interesting that I liked when he's like talking to the police and trying to explain like that he woke up in the middle of the woods and didn't know what was going on. They sitting at the dining room and there's um, he's talks. He talks about how the dining room has like is it's like a jawbreaker of paint, basically, that people just kept painting over it and over it and over it again. And then there was this little piece. There was this little chip that came out that he'd scratch into when he was nervous and I like that there's a line in there that he says that that he says like I learned that night that the first coat of paint on the table was yellow. Another that's another thing that's actually not mentioned in the original <laughs> that was added on in the in the novel. So because <laughs> yeah, pretty well in the in the basic one, it's uh, just like them talking about like oh, it's like oh I'm so glad you're back and like I don't know what I do. It's like it's like oh, like when we got your note, it's like what note. <laughs> But the, yeah, there's no mention of like the uh, the the them like talking about paint and stuff in by the uh, like well they're yeah the here table, we go so, that's um yeah we sat at a we sat at a table that my mother and I had used at a dining area when we ate and a workstation when I had school projects it was fairly large square table that had been painted white but there were several spots where daily use had started to chip the paint away revealing several different colors on top of the original coat whatever that might have been one area looked like the cross section of a jawbreaker a concentric rainbow ring so that my idle and nervous hands had helped uh, along with that more excavated section whenever I sat at the table to do homework or have a serious talk with my mother historically the most nervous the more nervous I was the more frantically I dug that night I learned the first coat of paint was yellow who the hell doesn't sand a table before you paint it? <laughs> uh, lots of people, actually. Have you have you not watched HGTV? No. <laughs> I, I just yeah, assumed no. that if you watch HGTV or DIY things. Network, you'll see a lot of you'll see a lot of like um, bad painting projects. Uh. Um, at least they got rid of. I think they at least on design to actually design to sells off the air because the housing market isn't crashing anymore. Um, but that was a show where, like, if they wanted to, if they there were a lot of houses in that show that had wallpaper, and they wouldn't take the wallpaper down; they just paint it. Oh Jesus! Oh. Or put up a new layer of wallpaper. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was actually um, a slight aside here. That's my favorite episode of um, of Trading Spaces. Um, <laughs> is that they're trying to fix? They're trying to fix the neighbors. Uh, they're trying to fix the neighbors' kitchen, and they want to take down this ugly wallpaper. So they use a steam thing. They use a steam press, and they peel off the wallpaper and find more wallpaper behind it. So they steam press that, peel that off, and find a third layer of wallpaper. They steam press that and find a fourth layer of wallpaper. Jesus. And they're just like, okay, we we can't remove it. There's too much wallpaper. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Uh, I have a friend yeah, with that's... a house, and uh, he was doing renovations, and he had three layers of drywall. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, fuck. So, clearly, you know, it's sometimes like, it's... just, uh, we, oh, we want to paint. Well, let's put up more drywall. <laughs> <laughs> Best part is they did it. Twice. Yeah, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's like that's like the that's like the really uh that's like the not scary version of House of Leaves. <laughs> you just keep noticing their house keeps slowly getting smaller. <laughs> wow. The not scary version of House of Leaves. Oh. Um, nice, yeah. But yeah, back to the story. So after the table thing, there's the part, cultist, you mentioned it, that um, they said like, oh, we, we thought uh, we thought you ran away. We got your note. And like, he's like, what note? And she hands it to him and he looks at it. And this comes to like what I think is like maybe the lamest twist in this series is that he's like, he looks at the note and he's like, I know I didn't like, I don't remember writing this. and I know I didn't write it because my name was misspelled. 
Yeah. And like, well, my first thought is like, makes note his, earlier that uh, he really knew how to spell his name, so that's sort of why they he did it that way. Yeah, it's just like it's just like it does. His mom knows he knows how to spell his name. <laughs> <laughs> She's yeah, the so- one that found the note. <laughs> There's there, so there's... many better ways to reveal this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but also, if you discovered your kid missing and you found a note on his pillow, you're not going to spell check it. <sighs> yeah, like, I guess. You're, like, you're it's kind just... of in a panic. Yeah, least... I guess I'll, I'll I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. It's just like, yeah. It is a weak reveal, but... I can kind I can, of understand Okay, I can understand it now, that you, now that you framed it that way. It's just like... And that's one of the things also in the in the short film. They actually call oh, the God. character Dathan in that, but in the yeah. short film, they have this long sequence of him like carving his name into a log. Yeah, he's just out in the woods. He decides decides to carve his name in the log, and then and the when they get the note, it's the exact same like style as his carving of the uh, of the uh, of his name. But I wonder in, if that's why they went with Dathan because yeah. it's like aside from the D, it's mostly angular letters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't like. So he spelled his like he like carved his name in the log there, and that's obviously where the antagonist, mis- like the guy who grabbed him or whatever, like saw his name. And then he like at the end of that that video, he's just like, "But my name's spelled wrong. Not that his, the name like that's not how I, sp- I write my name." So like, is it when I saw when I heard that, I was like, "Wait, so you didn't even spell your name right when you were out in the middle of the woods <laughs> on that log?" <laughs> You purposely didn't? I don't know. Like, maybe it's just, like, that's not how I... When yeah, he said the, that, like, the... it's not how I write my name is what he meant, but... Maybe, yeah. Like, like yeah, it's... I, I could have imagined this, like, yeah, this, this like, it wasn't in my handwriting, or I, I definitely didn't write this letter. Yeah, but, like, the way they um, say it in the in the film... And, I mean, there's some other things wrong with that film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, other than this. But, like, that's the thing that, like, after... At the very By the end of it, like, that, that was the thing that kind of stood out to me at the end. It was like, wait... What? <laughs> well, maybe you spelt it wrong while chiseling on the log, and it's like, damn it, I can't it. Yeah. erase it and change it to what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> How do you erase carving? Yeah. <laughs> ah, this, I just sharpened this knife. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's the first story, and this is um. <laughs> yeah, what? What? And I think the thing that's interesting in this is like, there's there's not even. Uh, there's no mention of the antagonist in this, actually. Like, aside from aside from the form of like mysterious footsteps and mysterious scratching mm-hmm. and a mysterious like the mysterious tree branch crunching. Yeah. Like we just know that there's some. We just know that there's something or someone. Yeah. I'm also not sure why he moved him to like another bunk of his bed first. Yeah, like like did it, like maybe he got spooked by the mom like getting up or something, and then but then how did he get out of the house so fast? Because I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because well, I mean, I guess it's like yeah, maybe he's testing there, the waters. There's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot to be left to the imagination. Yeah, that was his test run. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we find out later to test his might, to test his yeah. kid moving powers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it develops as it goes on in the stories, and we find that out. But. Yeah. Um, so going on with the stories. Um, also, you guys can interrupt me when you have anything to say. Um, yeah. Because I'm just going to um, keep running through these. Are we talking as we do the stories type thing. Uh, yeah, we have. Yeah. All right. Okay. Actually, yeah. Mikey's going um, to with footsteps, I guess. For the uh, internet version, uh, the part where he's talking about the bunk beds and about how he would go to bed on the top bunk and then he would. Two nights a week, he would potentially wake up on the in the bottom bunk uh, because he'd go to the washroom, etc. The paragraph ends with, but one night I didn't wake up on the bottom bunk. Which, of course, that's true because he'd wake up those other five days on the top bunk. So, that's just, just like an inconsistency. <laughs> well, it, he ended it before explaining that he was... In the forest was where he woke up. Yeah. <laughs> it just didn't make sense. He's like, well, of course you. <laughs> There's a, at least one night that you didn't wake up in the bottom bunk because you went to bed in the top bunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let me see. Do we have the. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to find it in here very easily. 
Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, I gradually the bars. Uh, my mind showed me the cylindrical bars of the mattress of the top bunk, but 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 beyond those, I saw stars. Gradually the bars melted away, and faded in, faded from my vision, and I was left only with floating points of light and the jagged crossing of tall trees that arched across them in the sky. I was in the woods. I shouldn't be here. I thought. That's a lot more eloquent than what we got. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. That is, yeah. Some, uh, he does start it with, size. one night I didn't wake up on the bottom bunk, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then, um, in the, the, when he's explaining sort of the forest, he's like, there's thorns everywhere. So it's not just the one that he stepped on. Yeah. They're everywhere, so... And they're going to cause his feet to bleed. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that was also the set the setup that like the fact that he didn't just sw- uh, sleepwalk out here. He was brought in. Yeah, but the but yeah, like, yeah, but because we don't yeah, have they changed that the rest in the novel, of the story just... yet. It seems like he was teleported there. That's yeah. the impression I got. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's huh. yeah. That's kind of the impression I got as well when I first started this. Yeah, and um, then. Like, he's hurting his feet, getting out of this forest, and then he starts going into a light jog. That's gonna hurt! <laughs> like, this is one really tough kid. <laughs> yeah, they actually mention that as he's uh, talking as he's talking about it. Like, they, let's see. Despite the impulse to quicken my pace, when I had my bearings restored and no longer had to watch the North Star vigilantly, my feet were in so much pain that I had to be mindful of each step. A distance I had covered in mere seconds by my nightly exodus from these woods would seem to be never-ending. I walk with a limp on both legs and attempt to putting too much weight on either foot. But when I saw the edge of the dirt woods floor pave, uh, cut off by the paved cul-de-sac of my street, I grew so happy to be so close to home that I broke into a light jog despite how much it hurt. Okay. How do you limp with both legs? It's really awkward, but you can. Uh, do it. I actually, I actually did that once when I had a really bad sunburn, like a second degree sunburn on both of my feet, um, and it was like my feet were so swollen that I could only put pre- I could only put my weight on my heels. Yeah. yeah so I was really- like, I had to gingerly kind of walk on both heels, basically. Yeah. Okay. Basically, you don't get anywhere quickly. Yeah. Okay. Oh. And that's pretty much my uh, notes on that. Although, in our version of the story, he doesn't... Mention me- the pain in that. Mention the pain, and uh, the North Star he's, is just the brightest star in the sky yeah, he's like, that he could find. Yeah, it's like, he, it's like kids think of like the North... Like, back when I thought the North Star was just the brightest star in the thing, that's what, the one I was following. <laughs> Whereas it seems like he just solidified, yeah, I was following the North Star because I knew what the North Star was. In the novel, yeah, I mean, I think he explains it here. Like, I kind of, I kind of like briefly reviewed this. I as a as a quick behind the scenes, I read this about a month ago. Um, I reread this a month ago. I read it about a year ago before that. Yeah, and that's when I took all the notes, and I kind of skimmed it over to try and get my bearings again. Um, so I might be con- uh, combining parts of this as I go along. No problem. Okay. Um. But yeah, there's nothing on that. We can go on to uh, Balloons, the second story. Yeah. Yep. That's good. Yeah, so Balloons, uh, we flash back. I think this is the... not quite the earliest story, um, but it's pretty early in there. Like, this yes, this skips yeah. around, and that's also what the framing device is designed to say. is like, I'm going to skip around a lot, because I'm just going through my memories and trying to... Rem- figuring out stuff from, like, all my journals and that kind of stuff. Um yeah, the skipping so, around yeah, a lot so, is painful in the uh, different stories. By the end, like I'm just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. But like well, the the gap between the third story and the fourth story was painful for me because it didn't give any yeah, frame of reference for the fourth story. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to the fourth <laughs> we'll story. I've got yeah. some I've got some feelings about the fourth story as well. Yep. <laughs> Um, so anyway, balloons, we flash back to the beginning of kindergarten where he talks about like his school had all of the classes divided up and different themes. Cause like kindergarten, you don't do much. Um, so they decided to have a big project that was, uh, his, his class, his class was like communication theme or no community theme. Community. Yeah. And, yeah. And so they did this whole huge, like 
project where they wrote letters and tied them to balloons and they had like and they had the return they had the address of the school and they the instructions were like to send a letter back and teach to teach kids about how far communication can go or something and you know the idea is they become pen pals and uh, I remember there's a thing in here that he talks about, like, they could write in markers, because they needed to write in ink after one year where everybody had written in pencils and all the balloons had gotten blown away by a storm and nobody could read any of the letters. <laughs> um, and then also kids could, like, paint on their letter if they wanted to, because it's kindergarten. Yeah. And so Steve, like, has this, like, meticulous story, has, has this meticulous letter that is, that is, like, mom helped him draft and he's he talks about how he's like he's holding it holding the thing in place with his cast because he broke his arm before school started, um, which doesn't actually come up much in this story. It comes up a lot in the later stories. Yeah, <laughs> but he uh, also like so he he writes this letter like meticulously copying it because he's afraid of other people judging him for his handwriting, and then also uh, attaches a dollar that has four stamps written on it. Um. And then, uh, oh yeah, and then also the teacher attaches a photograph of each student to the letters, and Steve writes his Steve writes his letter really fast because he had it pre-written and he was just copying it. So he goes to hang out with Josh as Josh kind of like freestyles his letter and comes back and he finds out that his like that this is the thing that I find funny is that they they write in ink and then Steve comes back and finds out that they write in ink so that water won't deface the letters and he comes back and finds that his letter is like almost unreadable after a few drops of water hit it <laughs> Um, yeah, because well, it's markers, so I'm assuming it's like water. Yeah, because yeah, because like it's markers. It's like yeah, that's gonna run like that's gonna run like I'll get up. Yeah, um, like pencil would probably actually be better, but like <laughs> yeah, or sharpies. I don't know, but yeah. they probably don't trust kids with permanent markers. No. Um, also, I just gotta say, like reading this, like now, and like I I remember actually doing a project like this vaguely when I was a kid. But like the reading it now, it seems like the dumbest idea at, <laughs> of all time. Yeah, but when you did it, did you include a picture of yourself? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry to catch a predator. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly <laughs> yeah. like the, the thing I was thinking so, of. So yeah, so one of the things is like um, uh, I didn't do this at my school, but I did it at my church because we always had like a rally day or something. Yeah, and. Uh, we'd always release, yeah, we'd always, apparent, I, I don't remember this, but my mom reminded me of it when I asked her, because uh, she's worked as a teacher for 40 years, and so I'm like, how how likely is it that this project would happen? Because this sounds like, this sounds really shady. Yeah, it sounds like a really bad idea, all things considered. And she, she mentioned, like, oh, yeah, you did this when you were a kid, at, like, at church at Rally Day, like, everybody sent out, like, postcards that they attached to balloons, and people would write back and stuff. And I, I don't remember that at all. Apparently, that my Here's church stopped doing that because. Huh? What other memories are you repressing? <laughs> um, I did do a. I actually did do a pen pal thing in first grade though, um, and mm. my letter was sent to another kid at a different school. And for a long time, I thought this was for security reasons. But again, when I asked my mom about how how a thing how a school would do this. She said, "Like, well, they wouldn't do balloons because, be- like, they wouldn't do balloons now because the whole balloon and picture thing would be really expensive. They just do yeah. inner district mail and just send it to another school because that way they can save on postage." <laughs> also, like, that oh, seems more that's... legit. Like to send it to a school, not just like. I mean, I get like it's, they're trying to do like community thing, but like it just seems like that's going to end up in the wrong hands like one time. <laughs> Which it yeah, does. But this was the nineties. <laughs> like I know, the yeah. 90s. It was, yeah. the, it was the Clinton White House. Things could only go up. <laughs> Nothing could ever go wrong. <laughs> but yeah, so apparently the only reason a school wouldn't do this project, like, wouldn't do the project this way is just because it's expensive. Yeah. Uh, especially with, like, all the Polaroid film they're using. Oh, yeah. Which I understand why they did it in this in this story for, like, you know, the immediacy of photos. So they'd yeah. have to take photos and, like, go and get them developed somewhere. Um, but anyway, to get back to the topic of the story, so, um, oh yeah, and there's, yeah, there's a lot of writing about, like, about the Pen Pal project and how, like, um, I remember there, there's there's this whole part about them all posing with their balloons, but, like, one kid gets so excited that he, like, lets his balloon go early, 
And the teacher's like, well, you're going to be the only one without a balloon. And he gets really sad. <laughs> um, and then there's also this other thing about, like, how uh, as the weeks as the weeks went by, like, kids got, like, photos coming in. And everybody was, like, so excited and proud to have, like, letters and photos and stuff coming back. And the teacher was, like, pinning them up everywhere. And Steve's, like, getting really distressed because, like, what if what if nobody found my letter? Like, I know I know that might not I'm, I know that might happen, but, like. But, but what if what if it happened? Because yeah. it's like, oh yeah, because you're a kid and you don't you 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 have the you don't have enough worldly knowledge to like worry about actual things. <laughs> this is the most distressing thing that's going to happen to you. Yeah, <laughs> you're not world weary yet. <laughs> yeah, and then it, eventually Steve gets gets a letter back, but he doesn't get a letter. He just gets like an envelope with a pol- with a blurry Polaroid in it. Mm. And then mm-hmm. over the course of the school year, he keeps getting like photos and eventually he's got like, I think 50? he says he's got like 50 of them 50. maybe. Is it 50? Yeah, it's oh, 50. Geez. Yeah, you're right. It is. Uh, uh, yeah, over over 50. Yeah. And let's see. And like the subject matter uh, and, is like just non like, na- it just seems like nature or like blurry, like images of like trees or branches and like a corner of a house kind of thing. Yeah, and like a, there's a street with some with some people on it that you can't really make out. Yeah. And then we go on to uh, we go on to summer vacation, um, and uh, they talk about how like Steve and Josh both got snow cone machines for Christmas, and they decided to sell snow cones, and they're both really bad at it. Um, and this is now a snow cone story. Yeah. Yep. Um, but then uh, Snow Cone Story comes up with a surprise, and uh, I actually kind of like this, that they set it up, and this story goes long enough that you forget about the four stamps dollar until suddenly some until it suddenly somebody back. buys a snow cone with the four stamps dollar. Yeah. And then he's, like, talking to his mom, and he's like, look, the stamps dollar came back to me, and he's and she's like, okay, that's nice. Go, go back out and sell your snow cones. Um... And then he, uh, and then he, like, goes and talks to, let's see, um, oh yeah, and then he goes and talks to Josh and is like, hey, check out all these photos I got, and Josh is super bored because he doesn't want to look at a bunch of blurry photos. Because mm-hmm, um, he's, you know, a normal kindergarten kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's, because he's anybody else that isn't this kid who got all the photos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then Steve's, like, looking at the photos, and he's like, wait, I'm in this one, and I'm in this one, and I'm in every single one of these photos. And it took me this long to figure that out. Yeah, I'm not sure how it took that long, but, like, whatever, okay. And then he tells <laughs> his mom about the photos, and she, like, freaks out because a dramatically convenient photo of him showed up um, in the mail that day or something too. It showed up in the mail that day and oh yeah, uh and it's a photo of him and it's a photo of him oh, and Josh playing in the yeah. ditch. Because yeah, the day before that they were out in the ditch and they kept hearing like robot eyes snapping sh- sounds or something like yeah. that. And oh yeah, I didn't was, even think about yeah. that. Yeah, that's the that was the camera shutter. Yeah. You didn't well, <laughs> and the Polaroid yeah. camera whirring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't, like, oh, yeah, I didn't think sounds. about the. I didn't yeah. think about the camera sounds. I just thought like the guy made weird noises when he was around for some reason because he <laughs> makes weird noises. That's his hallmark. I mean, you're not wrong, but yeah, like I instantly was like, oh, here's the. Uh, maybe it's because like I don't know. Again, I think of that shit nowadays. <laughs> being an uncle. Also, but, the, um... the other thing. I think this this story also had a really good like sudden ending. It like he's he's like why like why are you calling the police about this about the photo coming in? And his mom says because it didn't have a stamp. Yeah, exactly. It was just oh, which like the implication is this guy put it, it in their mailbox instead. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like it, it like it, it. Actually, like I think the first, at least the first couple of these stories are actually pretty solid endings, or like pretty solid for like their zingers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and their connectivity to each other. And then like the later ones kind of slog. But we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. But yeah, yeah, so that was that was balloons. Um, yep. There were some things I left out there. Like there's a whole like two pages devoted to him like cutting his finger on the snow cone machine. Uh, that's not... I don't think that's in the creepypasta. I think that's just <laughs> in the novel. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because he talks about how he had a really shitty snow cone machine, and he thought if he put crushed ice into it, it would be better, but the crushed ice just made it jam. 
And then he put and his so hand he stuck in his it. finger in there to get that to get the crushed ice out. Oh no! <sighs> See, and that's probably because he's supposed to be poor, but he he got a snow cone maker. Well, his yeah, well his mom got it for him for Christmas, and then Josh's family got his, um, which was a better model. <laughs> For his like birthday because he lo- he liked the snow cone machine that. Steve well, yeah, got. but what I'm saying yeah. is, is it probably was not in the creepy pasta, but they added it into the uh, novel to make it seem like. Oh yeah, but it was a super shitty. Yeah, yeah. It's like I mean he doesn't. Fuck he doesn't you! You still got a snow like, cone says, maker. I think the I think part of the, also the also part of the implication is just that these snow cone ma- makers were shitty in general. Yeah. Hey, these I are snoopy these snoopy are professional cone snow cone awesome. machines. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what did you say there, Matt? <laughs> no, these aren't professional snow cone machines, as long as Sam. Okay, yeah, mm, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, before we go into the next one, do you have any other nitpicks for this one, uh, Mikey? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't have any for this one or the next one because it. I just read them and was like, I can't really find anything, although I guess it was just the frame of mind, and then the yeah. next day I read the rest of them and was like, oh, there's a lot here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the later ones, yeah. I guess, and like I said, we're going to be following the format of, like, uh, we'll just interject and throw our stuff in, because, yeah. <laughs> All right, I think yeah, we're on for the next so, one. <laughs> boxes. Yeah, story three. Yeah, story three, boxes. Um... Which starts before kindergarten, um, and then, like, kind of happens around the same time as the other story. But Steve's talking about how he had a big tree in his front yard, and he liked to climb it. And he climbed it so much that, like, he got he could get really high really fast. And, like, he, I think he, yeah, he even mentions that he, the bark had worn off of some of the branches from it, from the grinding of his shoes. And, uh, eventually he... Uh, eventually, as as, it, as is inevitable, climbing the tree, um, he eventually falls and breaks his arm real bad. Uh, just before, uh, yeah, just before his first day of school. So he goes there with a cast, and he's like the weird kid, and nobody wants to sign his cast because nobody knows him. And there's like this kind of continuing theme in the rest of the stories about him being really a lot of an outsider, which is like why he kind of clings on to Josh so much. Yeah. Like, he's his um, only but to make, real friend. Yeah. yeah. And to make it up to him, his mom gets him a cat um, who they have declawed, and he calls his cat Boxes because the first thing that he did as soon as he was released from his, from, from his like, kitten carrier was crawl into an empty case of soda. Um, yep. And so... Uh, Boxes is a cat that likes to get out a lot and uh, likes to crawl in the crawl space all the time. And uh, eventually, I think it's Steve's mom who realizes that Boxes always comes to the can opener. And and so she just plugs the can opener in outside and turns it on and that'll normally get Boxes out. So... Uh, this so the story the actual meat of the story happens after the events of balloons, um, so they're they're getting ready to move out of the house because his mom doesn't feel safe there anymore, but she's not going to tell him that. Yeah, and uh, box and they've packed up the can opener. All the boxes are in the car, and then boxes, boxes. gets out of his carrier and runs underneath the runs underneath the house, and so his mom has to like get in and crawl around and grab him. And as she comes out, uh, she says, "Hey, we're gonna be leaving today." Yeah, like just immediate. Like, don't don't worry about those other boxes. We're just going now. <laughs> we're just we're just we're just gonna go. We're just gonna yeah. get we got boxes. Don't worry about it. Oh, don't worry about that other clothes in in, that, in your room. We'll, you can, we'll get some new we stuff. don't need to move those. That's just extra weight. We'll buy more things when we get to the next town. Because we're so <laughs> broke as. But we're just gonna buy new things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I think this is the panic response. It's like, yeah, we're 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 gone. Yeah, we're duskies. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about uh, about how he about moving away and uh, how it's kind of he was afraid it was going to strain his relationship with Josh, but he said, but actually, it made it stronger because now they had to work at it because they lived far away and now they can only meet up on the weekends, and so. 
Uh, I think. Oh yeah, and Steve, uh, S- Steve and Josh's parents each give them uh, one part of a matching pair of walkie-talkies that are powerful enough. Like, I guess this is like the Stranger Things walkie-talkie. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. that's like yeah. powerful enough that it can like go across town, go across. basically. Yeah, cause, yeah. Because they're all they're still in the same city. It's just they're in two different like neighborhoods, like on opposite sides, I guess. Yeah. So it's a yeah. pretty powerful walkie-talkie. <laughs> yeah. Or a pretty small city. Yeah, this is like, yeah, yeah um, this is, I think he even says this is like, this is, this is, this was like a military-grade thing, basically. Nice. Um, and so anyway, they have these, yeah, here we go. Um, uh, let's see, where's the thing about, oh yeah, I opened it to see a walkie-talkie. It wasn't any kind of packaging, and the cold utilitarian design in sharp contrast to the brightly colored tissue paper that lay under it. Uh, I gave Mom a quizzical look as I picked it up. It was a little heavy for me, and it seemed sturdy. I ran my eyes over the knobs and buttons. My mom smiled and told me to give it a try while tapping the rectangular protrusion on the side. So, See, I, I guess he doesn't say it's like... military grade, but it's kind of implied by, like, it's got a lot of dials, and it's really, like, it's really utilit it, it's real it's it she uses the word utilitarian design yeah and none um, of that um description of the walkie talkie is in the store is in the creepy pasta version yeah no it's pretty much just it references a very powerful walkie talkie it doesn't mention it being military at all or utilitarian that's probably because in the intervening time someone pointed out like hey kids walkie talkies don't go that far yeah <laughs> yeah Really um, as a slight like aside, that was actually a, um, when I was in Scouts, we actually had a, we had a single pair of, like, um, like, hiking grade walkie-talkies, which mm-hmm. are decent, like, they have a pretty good range, and, uh, during one camp out, uh, we discovered that when we tuned into a certain frequency, we could actually hit the, uh, we could actually hit the drive through speaker at a McDonald's. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that's kind of funny. <laughs> Did you guys abuse it at all? Or I think we I think we ordered fries. I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but okay, so yeah, so there's these heavy duty walkie talkies, so they can talk to each other whenever. Um, and then uh, at some point, boxes uh, run gets out of the house again. And Steve goes over to Josh's place, and Boxes has been out of the house for a couple of days. Um, and or no, it takes a couple. Of Boxes gets out when he's yeah. at Josh's place, and he's and his mom says, "Don't worry, he'll come back." And so Steve starts to think that Boxes maybe went to the old house because that's where he thinks he's supposed to go. Um, yeah. Or I think there's all. Oh yeah, there's a specific line in there. He thinks it's home, like I do. Yeah, that's in the creep pasta too. And yeah, and then it's like been a couple. Of, it's like a couple of weeks go by or something like that, and. Uh, in this no one, it's like a week. Like okay. it's it's not too much time. Yeah, it might be a, only like a week in the pasta, but yeah. And then they decide to uh... when he's over at Josh's house, he decides to go over to his old house because Josh's house is close to his old house, and he never went there himself because his mom said the neighbor, the new, the people that live there would get annoyed with him or something. And so they know they can just sneak through the. Uh, they know they can just they can just go through the woods because that's how they used to get around, and it'll shave a lot of time off. And Steve's kind of nervous because he remembers the time that he woke up alone in the woods. Yeah. To be fair, like if I woke up in the woods, I don't think I'd trust those woods after that. Oh yeah, no, that's like <laughs> yeah, trauma. That's not great. Yeah. That'd be a bit of a trigger. <laughs> or and then we just, also get a uh, we also get a call back to uh, how far do you think you can walk? Oh yeah, as they're walking through the woods, um, Steve is trying to break the tension and asks and asks Josh like, "Hey, how far can you walk into the woods?" And Josh says, "Halfway," and then you'll walk back out. And Steve's like, "How did you know that?" <laughs> and Josh is like, "You you you said it during lunch, like it was some kind of riddle, and then you immediately told me the answer and started laughing." <laughs> nice. <laughs> Oh, right, there's also this, like, two-page sequence of them trying to get a flashlight so they can go through the woods. What? <laughs> two pages? Because they're going to go out in the woods at night, like, alone. Yeah, like, no, I, I get... Oh, yeah, what? Yeah, they get... But they don't get a flashlight, per se. No, 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 that's a different one. Oh, okay. No, um, this, one, yeah. in, in the creepypasta, they just have a flashlight. Yeah, they just they just have them. Josh is just like, so they, having a flashlight. 
Yeah. yeah, so they get this, and yeah, there's this whole sequence in here where they have to sneak out into the garage, because that's where Josh knows his dad keeps his mag light, and so they're like trying to, s- they don't want to turn on the light in the garage, though, because they don't want to wake up his parents or alert anybody, and there's this part, there's like this incidental in here where they're trying to find their way around, and s- hey, what, hey man, what, I can't see anything in here, I know, me neither, do you have a flashlight I could borrow? And... <laughs> Like, about a half page of how they almost get caught because they're laughing so hard. Um, wow. But yeah, yeah, like, so. so so what I'm hearing is that it's a lot harder to get out of uh, Josh's house in the um, in the novel than it was in the pasta. Yeah, there's a, there's a... I, th- the I think one of the things maybe between the pasta and the novel is that the novel has a lot more, like, kid Padding! <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say padding because this stuff isn't like bad. Like it kind of like it doesn't. It's it's not necessary to the plot, but it it adds it adds some extra stuff. Like it reminds you that these are kids. Yeah, I, I guess like it, it puts a little bit more like thought into like how the kids would go about trying to do this stuff. And maybe that's like, going to be oh, the biggest difference we see here is that the kids act more like kids. I don't know. I don't know. So so far, I'm getting that like I mean some of the like some of it to me is kind of coming off as padding. Like I feel like some of the extra details were kind of unnecessary, but like the granddad's joke, yeah, or riddle, yeah, the sorry. Riddle. But I mean, again, like there are things like it, there are ups and downs to both versions of the story by the sounds of it. So yeah, I honestly so... like the flashlight joke. <laughs> Yeah, that is pretty. Because what I'm gonna say, like, uh, what I'm gonna say is, uh, I mean, yeah, it could be, it could be padding, but like, honestly, when you're printing, like, you want to cut down on how many pages you have, to a certain extent, unless he had like, you know, again, we were talking before the recording started about how printing's done in like indexes, and a printing company will will print will always print books a certain number of pages. Because that's just that's what their uh, that's what their printers and the uh, uh, whatever the thing is that like actually cuts the pages and like puts them together and stuff like that. That's all yeah. labeled in indexes, and so they'll always print that because that's what their machines are sent to print. So yeah, it's, not it's possible that could have been padded print. out to just add enough content so that there weren't a bunch of blank pages in the back. Yeah, and actually, you see that sometimes. Actually, I remember seeing that in novels uh, when I was growing up. Like a lot of like. A couple of, like kids, not like YA novels and whatever, would have like a couple of pages extra. And I always wondered about that. I guess now that makes sense. <laughs> that was just the, yeah. the press issue. Let's see. So they're going through the woods, and oh yeah, I forgot. There's they find this. They find the pool float, and the, yeah, they find the pool float again. And yeah. I think Steve rem- Steve Steve remembers it from well, Steve remembers it from the night he got trapped out in the woods, and Josh decides to lie down on it, and it's full of spiders. Um, it's full of spiders in the novel. Yeah, like he's yeah he's like running around. Huh. Let's see, there's no uh, um, for us. It was a rat. Yeah, where there was like a squealing sound, and then they were like, "Oh god, what is that?" And then they saw a rat like struggling to get out of the uh, balloon, and then they saw that. Yeah, like, they oh, changed yeah. it in this one. Also, What's wrong, Josh. That... He didn't he didn't respond with anything more than the same cries that when he pulled me out of the hole. He was trying to get out, but every time he'd rise up, he'd immediately fall back down. The whole process would start again. I wanted to help Josh, but I couldn't move any closer. My legs wouldn't cooperate. I hated these woods. I threw the flashlight to his free hand, but he stared at it, unable to break his paralysis. Uh, It wasn't until Josh roared coherently that I realized that I needed to force myself to move. I grabbed the discarded flashlight, shined it on my friend, not knowing what to expect. The light washed over his body, and I could see why he was that he was writhing violently, and the weathered and shark-shaped float descending beneath him. At first, I couldn't see what would be causing the panic. Then I shifted my gaze from the surroundings, and Josh, his plight came into view. Spiders. There were dozens of them, and crisscrossing patterns all across his arms and across his and, and his torso there must have been a clutch of them in the flute huh and it goes on for a bit about the spiders <laughs> yeah and then it also does mention like the hole that was suddenly there right like because there's a hole where there wasn't beforehand right or i think that i th- yeah and the, the the what i inferred from that was that was the hole from footsteps mm-hmm. oh is that what it was okay yeah, yeah. That's what I inferred. Like it's not mentioned, but that's that's what I that's what I assumed it was. Okay. Yeah, because it's the same location, so yeah. it would make sense to be the yeah. same as what was in footsteps. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, I know that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I if I like the fact that it was spiders now or rather than rat the rat because the rat like seems just as possible like or just as much of a jump scare kind of thing as um, the spiders would be. I mean, the spiders is definitely more of a like kind of like oh god, they're all over me so, kind of thing. So like, have you ever uh, have you have you had a pool? Um, yeah, like those rubber ones and like the inflatable ones that you put on. The no, I mean like a, like an in ground pool that you'd actually like have floats in and stuff. Oh no, uh, though we I have a lake, so or we have a lake at our cottage, so we use okay, yeah, those kind of things. Yeah. So one of the things one of the things I'll say is like we have um, uh, my parents have a pool and they have like a whole big like storage thing that they keep the rafts and stuff in. Gotcha. And yeah. the spiders thing hit a lot closer to me because one of the things is like. Basically, anytime we'd open that, there would just be a bunch of spiders in there. Yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, um, we actually had a, actually maybe the rat thing in, uh, inferred to me because like uh, when we were building um, a tree fort uh, at our cottage, um, we actually witnessed a like a rat fight <laughs> in like the bushes n- while we were building it. <laughs> so yeah, it was weird. <laughs> I've never seen wild rats. Well, it was like, yeah, it was like a rat and like a, it might have just been a, like a mangy squirrel, but yeah. I mean, it could, it could have been a rat. Rats are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And let's face it. Squirrels are just rats with fluffy tails. Yeah. That also live for like 25 years for some reason. That's, that's some other thing entirely. Yeah. Sorry. So I anyway, they get to, <laughs> they get to, they get to Steve's house and they find that it's like totally abandoned and there's a fence around it and the lawn has obviously not been mowed for a long time. Uh, obviously nobody lives here. Um, and you mean they his mom do... lied? Huh? Yeah. You mean his, his mom, mom lied. lied. <laughs> oh man. What? That doesn't make any sense. So they do rock, paper, scissors to decide who to decide who's going to go under the house and try and get boxes. Yeah. And Steve loses, and then protests, saying it's going to ruin his iguana shirt. Um. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is not in the pasta at all. He just like he's like, "Oh, but a rock paper scissors for it." I lost, and then he just goes into the into the <laughs> goes into it. <laughs> uh. Yeah, let me see if I can find because he he goes he goes into some detail about about this about this stupid. Sh- okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay, when I'm gotten from me at a souvenir Patty. shop when we visited my grandparents the previous year, it had an iguana wearing sunglasses and a Hawaiian shirt, lying in a beach chair and sipping out of a glass with a straw. Beneath the lizard in big letters, it says, Iguana another fly tie. I had no idea what it meant, but after ten minutes of nagging, my mom paid to have the design ironed onto a shirt my size. Wow. And he talks about how, oh yeah, the shirt was like, but... The thing that he realizes he looks down is his shirt is already like covered in dirt because he's been walking through the woods and he fell into a ditch. Yeah. <laughs> um and he's there's he's kind of worried he's like, "Oh no, my mom's going to know like or jo- my mom or Josh's parents are going to know that like we went out into the woods cuz we're like filthy." But yeah, so then he goes down into the crawl space and starts trying to find starts trying to find boxes and smells like decay. And finds a dead raccoon, which he's relieved is not his dead is not his cat. Yeah, I was um, and him and, really expecting mm-hmm. that to be the cat. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the that's the expectation. It's it's yeah. subverting your uh, your expectations there. And then he's uh he's talking to Josh over the walkie talkie. Um, hearing steps and yeah, he hears he hears footsteps above because he's underneath the house. Um. And uh, he's oh yeah he finds he finds a blanket that has some cat food in it, um, and Josh finds Steve's clothes and starts making fun of him for having his clothes, uh, have his, having his clothes hung up and putting all these putting all these photos all over the wall of his room like what the hell? And then he That's realizes dumb. that the photos are all over the room. <laughs> yeah, they're all over the walls of his room. And then Josh immediately shuts up and says, uh, and uh, yeah. And says, "There's someone in here." And oh There's yeah, Steve. In the house. <laughs> and Steve talks about like he's he's paralyzed with fear, which is uh, which is okay because even if he wanted to, he wouldn't have been able to get out because uh, Josh was supposed to be watching the entrance to the crawl space, but just decided to put the grate back on so that boxes couldn't get out. Yeah. Um. So that he could check the inside of the house. 
Um, and so he just keeps moving around under the house, like kind of listening to the footsteps up above, finds a giant pile of animal corpses. Uh, like, I think he says, like, they decayed into, like, a single mound or something. Um, and it's weird because we don't, well, like, we, yeah, we don't really get any gore in these stories. We just get these, like, weird kind of macabre images. Yeah, like, there's nothing, um, like, gooey or, like, really... Like just, it's like semi gross. Screens not... kind of has screens kind of has one, but even that's like more poetic than anything else. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. So uh, eventually, Steve hears uh, hears Josh scuffling with the guy because he hears the two footsteps, and then they're like fighting with each other. Um. And Josh uh, gets Josh. Uh, oh yeah! And he, during this time, he gets back to the grate and starts trying to kick it off, but he can't. And eventually, Josh uh, lets him out. Well, he hears that he hears one set of footsteps leave the house, and somebody opens the thing, and he's getting ready to like fight whoever took down Josh. But then it's Josh. Yeah. And so they they hop the fence. Josh loses his walkie, and. But they didn't uh, decide to just like, keep oh, running yeah. through the woods. Yeah, they decided to keep running because it's like, you know, there's some dude in there. He's like, weirdly took my picture. Yeah. Yeah, that was the other That's thing. Yeah, he, he, took his, he took Josh's picture, picture and then, yeah. Uh, yeah, at that point, like, I think that's that, that's a pretty logical, like, reaction. It's like, yeah, no, it's like, the walkie-talkie or your life <laughs> at that point. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's totally fair. And so they go back to Josh's house, and they sit in there and just stay awake until the sun rises. Um, and he try J- Steve tries to like clean the iguana shirt after because they realize they don't know how to use the washing machine, and it'll probably wake people up. So they just try and scrub the dirt out of it, and they can't. So Steve, oh yeah, so Steve throws the iguana shirt away. Um, specifically, he throws it away in. Uh, it's just before trash day. They mention so he throws it into the into the trash bin that's out in front of the house. Wait, trash and, day is on the weekend? Well, uh, just before know, trash, so if it's trash, on trash. Sunday. Then trash day might be Monday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Not it could bad. it could be that. Um, I just, uh, we, I just can't get over the fact that, like, how th- that that iguana shirt is kind of really patty. <laughs> well, okay, so here's the thing: is it comes back, in that um, as Steve's leaving, as his mom's backing out of the driveway, uh, he looks at the, he looks at the trash can and says, "I thought I closed the lid." Oh no! Yeah, I, I knew that was coming up when she said he goes to throw it into the trash bin in the last minute, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so, so they the, do give it some relevance there. And then it goes into cutting, like, uh, it goes to, like, uh, it jumps ahead a lot in time. Like, my mom didn't know about mm-hmm. what Josh and I had done that night. I'd spared the details um, of the situation. And, yeah, he talks to uh, he talks to his mom, like, why did you stop me from going back to the old home? And she grabbed my hand and locked her eyes to mine, and she whispered through clenched teeth, because they never put any fucking blankets or bowls under the bu- under the house for boxes. You think you're the only one to find to find them there? Don't tell me that I lied to you about there being. So, uh, don't tell me I lied to you about someone being in the house. God damn you! Um, and then it cuts back to the to the time of the story, and he comes home and he hears. Uh, and he hears boxes in the house, and he's like, "Welcome home, boxes." And then he realizes the sounds coming from his walkie-talkie, and yep. the story just ends with boxes never came home. Yeah. <laughs> Poor boxes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad he didn't. They didn't just like straight up like murder the cat. <laughs> Like it's in, it's yeah, implied well, it's, that like the cat is probably dead, but like yeah, kind of off screen well, tastefully. Yeah, it's good on two fronts because, yeah, they didn't kill the cat, but also because they didn't kill the cat, there's no resolution, which is what you need to do in a campfire story, is just kind of leave you there. Yeah. But yeah, so that was Boxes. Uh, Mikey, did you have any other nitpicks for that one? Um, no. <laughs> no. Like I said, I didn't have... He's not kind of disappointed by that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't understand how much Mikey uh, the East for Evil enjoys the nitpick court or the nitpick nook. 
So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like the, these first three stories are probably the strongest, I think. Um, I think the next three are probably... Uh, not all of them are the weakest, but I mean, like they all kind of like. I I, I, I liked like, reading them. I liked yeah, I liked maps, and I liked the last one. But screens is definitely like the weakest story to me. Maps for me, no. just like it seemed like kind of just like I mean, if it, it felt like it was a memory of like one of his childhood things that, and it did connect, but I, it didn't have a strong enough connection to me until like the very end of it. Yeah, um, I wonder if like this is a story that was actually made like shorter in the novelization. So let me see. It starts on page 113, and it goes until page 161, which puts it about on pace with the rest of the stories in here. Like, 40, 50 pages. The rest of these are about 30 or 40 pages. Yeah. I, I just remember that this one, like, they had a, he goes into a lot of detail about, like, their procedure of, like, mapping out um, their woods and, like, them doing the like the their big project to fully map out the the river the the creek in the woods, which we'll get to in the as we go through it. There's yeah, this is. I think it also feels like a longer story because there's like two different stories going on here. Yeah, and then they try to con- and then like it just has this like kind of not connected, kind of connected like story with um uh the old woman. Yeah, Mrs. Which Maggie. again, yeah, Miss Maggie, and then like. Again, like, the ending part, like, is creepy of what happens, but, like, I don't understand why it happened, but we'll get into it once we, once it's, once we get through it. So, I need to, yeah, we need to <laughs> explain All what right, happens. Alright, yeah, so... the uh, the rundown again like you always do on the crossovers yeah i mean i've got the notes so yeah i'm All like right, arby's cool. except instead of meats i have notes well i know, what our, our, I know what our title card's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> you in an arby's suit <laughs> i don't know why what is but... an arby's suit <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a mascot maybe or something i don't know what is mascot. the Arby's mascot? <laughs> a giant a cowboy hat? <laughs> yeah, the hovers the over your man. head when you're hungry. Uh, I don't know. It's not a mascot, it's just a symptom. Alright. It's <laughs> not <laughs> a mascot, it's a symptom. Alright, anyway. Alright, anyway. Alright, anyway. Alright, anyway. All right, anyway. All right, anyway. All right, anyway.